When people think of Tanzania and the fabled northern route, they often refer only to Ngorogoro Crater in the Serengeti. Ironically, most safaris start from Arusha town and miss one of the most scenic and wildlife-laden parks in Africa, its namesake, Arusha National Park. Likewise, as they travel from Arusha town to Ngorogoro, they pass another national park that anywhere else in the world would be the tourist draw. It has incredible scenery, loads of wildlife, great driving routes, and clearly shows evidence of one of the most awesome geologic events that is still ongoing. That is Manyara National Park. Join us this week as we explore two hidden wonders of the north, Arusha and Manyara National Park. Virgin Atlantic flies from the US and Canada to England and Scotland and onwards to destinations in Africa, India, the Middle East and Asia. Sir Richard Branson's Transatlantic Airlines is a proud sponsor of public television. Jumbo. I'm Bill Ball, and I'm going to be your guide on this episode of Journeys in Africa. And this is Africa. The African experience was summed up by Ernest Hemingway when he said, All I wanted to do was get back to Africa. We had not left it yet, but when I would wake at night, I would lie, listening, homesick for it already. Join us each week as we explore the entire continent of Africa, from the plains of the Serengeti to the heights of Kilimanjaro and all points in between. We'll introduce you to the history, culture, and wildlife of one of the most exotic and extraordinary places on Earth. Journeys in Africa. Welcome to Arusha Town, the gateway to Tanzania's famed northern circuit of national parks. In today's episode, we're going to visit two of those national parks, Arusha and Manyara. We're also going to learn a little bit about how coffee is planted, and of course, we're going to visit Arusha Town itself. Arusha Town is located in the far north of Tanzania near the Kenya border. It is located adjacent to Arusha National Park and just south of the highest peak in all of Africa. Mount Kilimanjaro. The town and national park are surrounded by hills and mountains, making it lush with vegetation and great for coffee production. To the west of Arusha town is the road to Ngorogo Crater and the Serengeti, passing by another great national park, Minyara. Well, here we are in the middle of Arusha town, and if it looks a little familiar, you're probably right, because behind me is the clock that's supposed to be the midpoint between Cairo and Cape Town. Also, this is the area where the little elephant in Hatari ran across the street. So, let's explore Arusha Town. Arusha Town is not a bustling megacity like Nairobi or Dar es Salaam. But as the gateway to the Northern Circuit, the most famous wildlife route, it has all the amenities that a safari goer needs. There is an international airport, safari outfitters, and of course hotels. There are many comfortable hotel choices in Arusha from hostels for the backpacker to more upscale hotels for the modern Western safari seeker. You do not need to give up comfort when in Arusha. This is a modern hotel town, even if the locals don't have a lifestyle Western travelers do. The biggest fear most Western travelers have about going on safari is the hotel accommodations. This is one worry that can be put to rest. Hotels fit all budgets and tastes and can literally be some of the best properties you will ever stay at. Meals are not a problem either. Western cuisine and a touch of Africa is available in most hotels. Some of the best restaurants can be found in the hotels with European trained chefs turning out delicious meals. Morning starts with a breakfast buffet that will fuel the safari goer for a long but fruitful day in the nearby Arusha National Park. On the way to the park, you can't help but notice the many fields of coffee. Coffee is the major crop in this part of Tanzania. In fact, for many years, coffee was the major export earner. Coffee, though, now suffers from the international swings of pricing and is now falling behind tourism and mining. 
The bulk of the coffee production, over 50,000 tons, is a mild Arabica coffee used primarily in quality blends. Small landowners still produce the bulk of the coffee, though large plantation owners, some having over one million coffee trees, are growing in importance. A white flower blooms in October and November, which soon turns into green berries that, when ripened, are bright red. The ripening takes nine months, with harvests from July to September. As you near the park, the coffee fields give way to the lush, green-covered mountains and craters. This is where civilization ends and the African wilds begin. Arusha National Park is unlike the other parks in the northern circuit of Tanzania. It has heavy rainfall, it has dense forests that are perfect for primates, and it has a great variety of lakes, like this one, Lake Longgill, which has a wide variety of rare water birds. Lying between the majestic peaks of Kilimanjaro and Mount Meru, the 137 square kilometer park is incredibly beautiful. With a wide range of habitats, lakes, forests, savanna, and transition zones, this park offers the safari goer an astonishingly good variety of flora and fauna. Associated with these different vegetation zones are a diverse array of wildlife. Altitudes in the park range from 4,800 feet above sea level to a staggering 15,000 feet at the summit of Mount Meru. The mountain and hills are covered in thick forest, giving cover to a wide variety of species, including several primates and antelope. The open grasslands are haven to buffalo and water buck. The lakes are great places to observe aquatic birds. In fact, the variety of habitats have attracted almost 575 species of birds to this rather small park. All of this ecozone diversity has its roots in geology and major, if not catastrophic, geologic events. Arusha National Park lies on the eastern edge of the Great Rift Valley, a fault in the Earth's crust that stretches from Turkey in the north to Mozambique in the south. This nearly 5,000 mile long fault was created over 20 million years ago. Here at Arusha, the fault, which is actually pulling the continent of Africa apart, caused a vent to open, forcing molten rock to the surface, forming a cone. This cone expanded under pressure of the underlying gases until, like a balloon that is overinflated, it exploded, leaving behind the crater. The volcanoes in the area are now either extinct, meaning they will never erupt again, or they're dormant. They have the possibility of becoming active in the future. The land that was left behind included the mountains, volcanoes that are dormant, craters, and lakes, and a savanna area known as the Little Serengeti. At the Momella Gate is an area called Serengeti Nagordo, or the Little Serengeti. This is an open grassland area and only place in the park where you can see Birchall's zebra, the common zebra. Zebra are open plains animals and are the ones here in the park are quite literally trapped here. Human settlements around Arusha has blocked any migrating routes that they once followed. Zebra live in family units with a dominant male or stallion and a half a dozen to a dozen females and their young. Males without a harem often form bachelor herds where they ready themselves for the day that they might get their own females. Other animals use the savanna as well, including buffalo, giraffe, and warthogs. In fact, warthogs are one of the more common mammals seen in Arusha. They adapt well to the variety of habitats. They are usually found in female groups with their young from possibly the last two seasons. The males, with their curved tusks, are loners, except in the mating season. Warthogs are omnivorous, meaning, like us humans, they eat plant and animal. This gives them the maximum chance to survive in the many environments. Arusha National Park is an easy park to visit on a day trip out of Arusha Town. Once into the park, just past the Little Serengeti, the road becomes easy to follow as it heads north to the Momella Lakes and then west to the Maru Crater. The main park tracks or roads link all of these areas of the park. It is best to take a four-wheel drive vehicle through the park. However, during the dry season, the main track is passable to a sturdy sedan car. There are areas set aside for animals only, no vehicles allowed, like the crater floor, and walks in other parts of the park require an armed ranger to accompany you. But, unlike many parks in Africa, Arusha does have several areas where you can leave your vehicle for great photos or a picnic. 
As you venture into the park, one of the first animals you'll see is the giraffe. This tallest of all mammals has adapted well to both the savanna and the forest edge where they can feed on the leaves of the tallest trees. This allows them to feed where few other mammals can. One of the easiest ways to tell the difference between males and females is size. Males weigh up to a ton and are over 17 feet tall. Females are smaller and about three feet shorter. But probably the best way to tell the men from the women is by their horns. They are not true horns in the sense of a buffalo or antelope, but rather thick in bone. True horns have a hard exterior with living tissue that grows in the inside. Males' horns, for a lack of a better term, are thicker than the females and lack the tuft of hair that is found on the ladies of the giraffe world. The reason males are, shall we say, bald, is their tendency to fight for a harem. They use their neck, head and horns, and the hair becomes a casualty of war. This is a case where necking is not so romantic. Giraffe's height is not only an aid in feeding, but also spotting predators. Other animals can take cues from the giraffe since they can spot predators earlier. Here at Arusha, the giraffe's one major predator, the lion, does not exist. So giraffes here are a lot less skittish. Another adaptation to Arusha is the food choice. In the savannas, they feed mostly on acacia trees, while here, they eat a wide variety of leaves. There are a number of subspecies of giraffes, and in Arusha, it is the Maasai giraffe. They are characterized by irregular star-shaped markings, which virtually cover their entire bodies. Giraffes are one of the more common mammals of Arusha, but probably the biggest draw to the park, outside of the spectacular scenery, are relatives of ours, the primates. The largest primate in Arusha is the olive baboon. These monkeys are quite numerous in the park, and they are monkeys, not apes. One telltale sign is just that. They have a tail. They are gregarious animals traveling in troops of 30 to 100 individuals. These troops are made up of females and their young, adolescents, and several adult males. To prevent inbreeding, the baboon have developed a behavior where the males, upon reaching maturity, leave their birth troop and join another one. Males are easily distinguished from females by their size, large mane, and their teeth. Males have large canines. The baboon diet consists of fruit, grass, insects, roots, and I have even seen them gang up and kill a small antelope. They are true omnivores. We are not far different in our diet as our cousins. Baboon troops in larger, less lush parks have territories that can cover two plus square miles. This is not the case in Arusha, where the territories are much smaller. When looking for baboons in Arusha, look up in trees, on the roadsides, and even on the roads. They are comfortable in all areas of the park. Baboons are social animals and display that every day in their grooming routine. Grooming is a hygienic in that it gets rid of skin pests, but it is also a form of bonding, sort of like giving our significant other a back rub. One of the hardest primates to see, but maybe the one that brings in the most tourists to Arusha, is the beautiful black and white colobus monkey. Usually only seen high in trees, the colobus monkeys are the most arboreal of all African monkeys, rarely descending to the ground. They are hard to spot, but when you see one, it is truly breathtaking. Another monkey species you're likely to see is the blue monkey. They get their name from their bluish black color. This fairly large forest species can be up to four feet long with its tail and weigh 22 pounds. They live in troops up to 30 individuals, though in Arusha, you usually see smaller groups. When you visit the park, you're most likely to see them foraging in the trees for their favorite foods, fruits, flowers, bark, leaves, seeds, and even the occasional insect. Like their human cousins, they usually have one baby with rare twinning possibilities. As we drive deeper into the park, we begin to see the diversity that makes Arusha so attractive. Soon Lake Longi comes into view, and it is now clear why so many animal and bird species are found here in Arusha, the availability of large amounts of water. There is no need for the mass migrations of the Serengeti. That, remarkably, is only a few hours' drive away. Even when Longi dries up, the tall grasses remain for the grazing animals. Not far from the fresh water of Lake Longi are the Momella Lakes, which are largely fed by underground streams. 
These are not freshwater lakes. They are highly alkaline and thus quite salty. Animals do not drink from these waters. Unlike Lake Longy, which is full of tilapia, these lakes contain few fish. Each of the Momella lakes have different mineral contents, resulting in a wide variety of algal growth. Because of this, each lake has a different terrestrial and water bird visitor. There's one antelope species, though, that thrives in and around the lakes. The water buck is built for lakes and marshlands of Arusha. These are hefty antelope with a distinctive white ring around the rump. They can often be detected by the musky scent that is given off by their oily hair. Unlike many other hoofed animals, they live in mixed herds with multiple males and females. As we head west from the lakes, we enter our fourth area of the park. We've already seen the Little Serengeti, the forest, and the lakes. That brings us to the crater zone. The whole park owes its diversity to violent volcanic eruptions. The aftermath of those eruptions can be seen in what is today's craters and valleys. The craters and their valleys help create the lakes and the magnificent forests for the park's big game to inhabit. The very existence of the forest is due to the mineral-rich soil created from volcanic ash. The scenery is absolutely awesome. Even if Arusha didn't have big game, this would still be a reason to visit. Because there aren't any lions in the park, you can leave your vehicle at overlooks and blinds. Take advantage of that and see the sheer beauty of the park. Don't get caught up in just counting animals or taking that perfect frameable photo. Take a moment to enjoy the surroundings. There is no better place than among the craters and valleys. There is one of the big game animals that seems to enjoy the valleys in particular, the African buffalo. These are the most common of the big five in Arusha. There are a few elephants and leopards here, and occasionally a migrant lion passes through. Lions were here, but unfortunately were shot out, making these buffalo the most feared of the big five in Arusha. Don't let their docile looks fool you. They have a potential to be man killers. Found in large herds, buffalo are great grazers. These are big animals. Males weigh upwards to 2,000 pounds and are five feet at the shoulders. They travel in large herds with females, young, and mixed males. They are quite protective of their young and will form defensive rings to stand off lion attacks. Of course, that's not necessary in Arusha. Here, buffalo have no natural predators. Buffaloes have difficulty regulating their body temperature and they never wander far from water and their favorite wallows. That makes the crater valleys particularly good habitat for them here in Arusha. As I alluded to before, Buffalo are one of the most feared and certainly most unpredictable of the Big Five. Stories from early hunter days claim that a wounded buffalo would actually double back to attack the hunter rather than just flee. Watching them calmly eat here in Arusha, you would never get that idea. The Big Five were named so because they were the most dangerous to hunt. Trust me, buffalo are definitely proof that looks can be deceiving. We have certainly covered Arusha and all of its diverse habitats. From savanna to forest and lakes to craters, Arusha seems to have it all. But we have another very scenic park to visit, Minyara. So it is time to say goodbye to Arusha and hello to Minyara. Minyara National Park is only a few hours drive from Arusha National Park along well-maintained paved roads located midway between Arusha Town and Ngorogoro Crater Conservation Area. Minyara is often mixed in the excitement to get to Ngorogoro in the Serengeti. The best place to start talking about Manyara is on the overlook next to the road on the way to the more famous Tanzanian parks of Ngorogoro and Serengeti. This park, like the others around it, was born out of a geologic mega-vent that created the Great Rift Valley. Often called the Emerald of Africa for its lush green valleys and lakes, it is also beautiful like that precious stone. The name Manyara is from the Maasai, meaning a corral or a living stockade made from plants that keep their cattle in and predators out. That is actually quite a fitting name since the lake and the namesake park sit below the towering walls of the Rift Valley. In fact, that is what we're standing on filming the valley below. It is at the base of the eastern rift that the park sits. In this part of Africa, the Great Rift Valley actually splits into two parts, a western and an eastern rift. The split merges south of here before it ends up at the mouth of the Zambezi River. Manyara National Park is dominated by two huge geologic features. One is the lake itself, which can cover two...
two-thirds of the total acreage of the park. The other is the Great Riff. Here you can literally see the earth tearing itself apart. The lake itself lies at the basin with no outlet. The Ngorogoro Highlands are on one end and Mount Maru and its foothills are on the other. This trapped water is like no other inland freshwater lakes. It has collected chemical salts that are dissolved as the rains wash over the volcanic ash on the rift walls. As the sun evaporates the water, it leaves behind these salts, increasing in concentrations, making it alkaline or a soda lake. The park has two major ecozones, the forest and the savanna. As you enter the forest zone, you can't help but reflect on Arusha. A similar forest was created out of this dramatic geologic event. The first animal we spot is the water monitor. These large reptiles are the relatives of the better known giant of lizards, the Komodo dragon that is found in Indonesia. The monitor family has large representatives in Asia, Australia, and of course here in Africa. These water-based lizards primarily eat birds' eggs, fish, and just about anything else they can catch or scavenge. They are just as adept in the water as they are on land. Just where does all the water come from to make these forests so green and allow for the streams and lakes? The annual rainfall is only about 30 inches, just about what New York City gets. The valley only survives as it does from seepage from the rift itself. The water actually fell from the eastern side of Ngorogoro Crater. So once again, the rift plays a major role in the ecology of the park. The water is important to many species, few more so than the wide range of aquatic birds. Egrets, ducks, herons, ibis all make their home here in Manyara. Nearly 400 species of birds are found in the park. That is competitive with the number of species found in the entire United States. Most prolific and famous for Manyara are the aquatic birds. But though the aquatic birds really need the water, there is one animal that not only makes it its home, but it is the king of the waterways, the hippopotamus. Hippos are found throughout much of Africa with strong numbers in East and South Africa. They are big ones, weighing up to three tons. Hippos need the water because their bodies easily overheat and need cooling, which the water provides. They may even mate and give birth underwater. Hippos leave the water at night. Here in Manyara, they eat mostly sedge, which thrives in the alkaline areas rimming the lake shore. The aquatic birds and hippos get along well, with the birds often roosting on their broad backs. Aquatic birds aren't the only ones in the park. Crown hornbills are only one of several species of hornbill found in the park. Hornbills eat pretty much anything from small animals and insects to seeds and fruit. Their bills aid them in getting the food and opening it. They aren't really related to the South American toucan, but parallel evolution has equipped both birds with a similar tool to exploit the same niche. As we drive to the large savanna area of the park, we encounter big game most people think about when the word safari is mentioned. In much larger numbers than Arusha, the antelope and other hoofed animals make Minyara a photo safari paradise. Minyara has giraffe, impala, buffalo, wildebeest, zebra, and both lions and leopards. If you started your safari in Arusha, as many do, this is your first chance to see big cats. But if you don't see them here, don't worry. You will see them in Ngorogoro and the Serengeti, which are just a couple of hours down the road. If all this looks familiar to you, it may be due to the fact that the early Tarzan movies were filmed in Manyara. For a park roughly half the size of the city of Chicago, it has a lot to offer. It kept Tarzan busy, didn't it? Arusha town is just a couple hours drives from Nyara and a short drive from Arusha National Park, making Arusha town a great place to hub and spoke. You can also take these parks in when going to or returning from Ngorogoro and the Serengeti. You'll pass them either way. The road connects the northern circuit of parks. Our day here at Manyara National Park is coming to an end and so is the episode, but we sure crammed a lot into it. Not only did we visit this national park, but we visited Arusha National Park, Arusha Town, and we learned a little bit about how coffee beans grow. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. In Arusha Town, we found ourselves in the middle of action in Africa. Quite literally, Arusha is the midpoint between Cape Town and Cairo. In Arusha National Park, we were able to see the zebra of the plains, the colobus monkeys of the forest, and the buffalo of the wetlands and crater floor. Finally, we ventured in Minyara National Park, 
where Big Five can be spotted by the lucky traveler as well as giraffes, hippos, and a wide range of bird life. This is Africa at its very best. I'm Bill Ball, and I'll see you on the next episode of Journeys in Africa. Virgin Atlantic flies from the US and Canada to England and Scotland and onwards to destinations in Africa, India, the Middle East and Asia. Sir Richard Branson's Transatlantic Airlines is a proud sponsor of public television. To learn more about the people and wildlife of Africa, the shows or to purchase the DVD of the series, visit our website at www.journeyswithbillball.com